Hello, writing workshop. Sorry about the delay on today's lesson video. I had to do a little bit of adjusting in order to split this lesson between today and tomorrow and make it virtual. So we'll make the best of what we got. Um, it is a virtual day, uh, just like Monday. I would encourage you to take a moment to pray. Uh, pause this video if you haven't prayed yet. Say a quick prayer for your learning today, and then we'll continue. All right, I hope that was enough uh, time for you to pause and pray if you needed to. Our objective for today is to follow the steps of the research process. Our next major writing project does have a pretty big research component to it. So I want to use this week and next week to do, to do some reviewing about research and get some of the initial research done for this project. What's going to work for us on this virtual day is just to work through what are called our notes on the research process. I don't actually have any notes for you to fill in. This video will work as a nice little refresher or review of how the research process works so that we can practice research throughout this week and next week. Our next essay, again, is a research paper, so it's good for us to do this uh, initial review first. One thing I will say, too, is that we do actually have class tomorrow in person, as far as I can tell. I don't know what's going on with uh, another possible virtual day or the weather or anything, but please be ready to have some class component tomorrow as well. I know it's a Thursday, but they are making it an all-eight day. What we'll do tomorrow is play a research game, so this video will be helpful. I also want to take some time to wrap up our colons practice from yesterday, especially because I know some of you are not here in class on that day. I'll also uh, point out with that too, let me just back out to that real quick. I did leave Tuesday's lesson, video, or, uh, lesson folder right below this one's as well, so if you need to double back to colons notes, you can. Notice that I did change the deadline for Colin's notes and practice to Friday so that we can take some time in class tomorrow to discuss, give you some time to complete it at that point. Anyways, right now we are watching our research process notes. I'm going to try to keep this pretty quick. I don't remember exactly how long this PowerPoint is, but I'll work through it. I'm just going to click the view button so, you can, uh, so we can read it this way. Obviously, you can read these for yourself by doing that same function. Just want to give a little refresher on how research works, and I'll have to zoom out a bit. That's probably good. Call this presentation the research process. Just like the writing process, research is also a process. It has steps to it. This PowerPoint breaks down what those steps are. The first step to good research is to write research questions. Um, in order to find information, especially using the internet, we want to be able to write questions that are going to lead us in the right direction. The first step is to select a general topic for research. We'll talk about our possible research topics later this week. But we'll also want to write questions that guide your research. Um, a little pro tip with that too, asking good questions does make for strong database searches. So it's a lot easier. So for instance, I'll use trees as an example. If I type in the word trees into Google, I'm going to get billions of results. But if I ask a question about trees, if I ask something like how many different species of trees are on Earth, it's going to give me a much more specific search, and it's going to give me better sources for finding that information. In informational research, I should note, so informational versus persuasive research, our research project is a little blend of both. Informational research is just about collecting and presenting information. Um, you'll likely need a series of questions to, uh, to aid in collecting lots of info. Persuasive research is using research to convince your audience either to think a certain way or to do a certain thing. For persuasive, you may only need a few uh, research questions. Uh, it really just depends on your topic and what you're looking for and how you're planning to persuade your audience. The second step in research and what we'll be practicing tomorrow especially is finding reliable sources. As you guys know, the internet is a fantastic tool for finding answers. You guys grew up with Google pretty much your entire lives. As we also know though, the internet is not regulated very tightly. Um, which is a good thing and a bad thing, right? On the internet, it's good that it's not super regulated by the government because it's a spot for free speech and free trade of information. Um, we do know that with that, there's a lot of dangerous stuff on the internet, and we also know that there's a lot of misinformation on the internet. Because of that, we do have to evaluate the credibility of all potential sources. Uh, the first thing you want to look for for credibility is a website's domain name. That would be the dot whatever that, go that goes after its web address. Uh, dot orgs, dot govs, dot edus are the most credible in general. Those are all established organizations, government websites. Edu is, dot edu is usually colleges in, the, in uh, the United States. Dot com, dot net, dot info are probably the three most common 
uh, at least .com and .net are two of the most common on the internet. But we do have to be really careful when we examine those. Reason being is that anyone can make a .com. So if I want to make MrHantechIsAwesome.com and then tell you about all the crazy awards I've won, I can certainly do that, even if it's not necessarily true. We do have to be extremely careful if the URL ends in any other domain besides these. I'm not sure why there's a little period there. Um, but .biz, I would avoid... Uh, any two-letter codes, .io, .tv, we have to be really careful with those too. There might be a couple that are credible. It's like .ca is Canadian websites, .uk is British websites, uh, .de is German websites, and so on. We do have to be really careful when we're evaluating anything besides .org, .gov, .edu, and to a lesser degree, .com, .net, .info. A little more extensive way to think about this is called the crap test. If any of you have had at least Mrs. Schley in the past, you've seen this before. These are just a series of questions you can ask when you're uh, evaluating a, a website's credibility. I'm not going to read all this just word for word for the sake of time, but in general, we want uh, information to be current. So uh, if you notice that a website is dated 1999, it's probably too old to be trustworthy. That was, what, 25 years ago almost? Along with that, if a website has no visible date, that could be a red flag for us as well. So we want to know that the information is up to date. Relevance is another simple question to ask. Just Is this information useful for your needs? Or is it not necessarily giving you solid information? It's something to look at. Authority is another one. This is probably the most important in my mind. Um, the question to ask here is, can I trust the source of this information? Is there an author, publisher, source, or sponsor listed? Um, if there's none listed, that could be a red flag. If there is an author listed, can you look up that author's other work to see if the, the author is credible on that? Those are just some ideas when it comes to authority. Along with the authority question, that's where we reach things like Wikipedia as well. As many of you may know, Wikipedia is a great source for information. It's just not credible because none of the authorship can be verified. I, I have no idea who wrote what on any Wikipedia article, even if the information is good. Ac speaking of good information, accuracy. just Is the information true, right? Can you verify it uh, uh, against other sources? So, for instance, if I'm researching, I'll just say... I'll say animal testing, right? And I see one source that says that, uh, I'll just make up a number, 42 million animals die each year due to animal testing. If I don't trust that number, I'm going to try to verify that across other sources, right? Let's say I look that up and five other sources say it's only 20 million, right? I'm probably going to trust the ones that have more verified numbers than the one that said 42 million. Or it might just cause me to research even deeper just to see if I have better search terms to look for. I just saw another question there too. Does the language seem unbiased? We'll talk a little bit about uh, news media bias as we move forward with our writing project too. But when we think about uh, looking up news sources especially, we especially want to stick with as uh, really the most moderate sources we can find. As we know, there are some news sources that are very, very, very conservative, scary right-wing stuff. We also know that there are websites that are very, very, very liberal and they're going to give you a biased view on what's going on in current events. Last thing is purpose, the reason the information exists. A couple of uh, things to consider here. If a website looks unprofessional, it probably is. If a website looks like it's designed for children, it probably is. So if you want to ask the question, okay, does this seem like a professional source? Does this seem like something that doesn't have some kind of hidden agenda? Um, those are questions to ask about purpose. Step three, so let's say you found some good sources that you like for research. The next step is to collect information. You will want to keep track of any specific details that you want, uh, especially if you're thinking of a research paper that you may want to direct quote. What do I want to take word for word and copy into my essay? Um, or paraphrase. What are those ideas that I can put in my own words um, that I still need to cite, that I still need to give credit for? There's different methods you can use for organizing findings. Some people like to write research note cards. Other people might like to use like the bookmarks tab where my cursor is now to keep track of, uh, of websites that you wanna double back to later. Uh, you might print off articles and annotate them. There's some different ideas for organizing information. One thing that's really important to note is that whether you're choosing to quote or paraphrase, you still need to cite your source. A lot of people forget that even paraphrases need citations. 
We do need to give credit to where that information comes from so that we don't accidentally plagiarize. In-text citations, which we'll practice throughout this next month or here, uh, they prefer author if the author is listed. If there's no author listed, we have to use the title of the article or website. So it should also be noted that if page numbers are there, which is kind of rare on the internet, we should use them too. So for instance, let's say you're reading an article on the internet that does have page numbers. If the author's last name is Hantech, your parenthetical will be Hantech 15. Let's say there's no page numbers, no author. We're just going to use the title of the article in quotation marks, like you see under my cursor here. Citation will be something we have to practice bit by bit over these next couple weeks, and that's okay. And then the last step is to cite sources more extensively. Um, for this particular research paper, we are going to write full citations as well. Um, the purpose of this is just to allow your audience to verify information on their own. So let's say I use that number, that 42 million animals die each year from animal testing. If I have an audience that really wants to, to see that that information is trustworthy, they should be able to just go right to my works cited page, check my citation, and then check that source for themselves. That's what I hope to do with your essays too. If there's something that seems fishy in your arguments, I should be able to just look that up and go straight to the source where you found it too. That's where works cited pages come into mind. In MLA, we list them alphabetically by author's last name. Works cited pages we will devote a lesson to later on. If you're thinking of college, and depending on what degree field you go into, you may be asked in the future to use APA. Those are for like hard sciences, most social sciences like psychology and sociology. It's called a references list in that field. I can't actually see that. Um, in Chicago and Turabian, that's a very different way to cite sources. That's what they use in like history, religion, uh, some other social sciences as well. Law is kind of a similar field too. It works a little bit differently. We're going to be practicing MLA this year, so we don't have to worry too much about APA or Chicago. There is a site that you can follow here. I believe you can click right into it. The Purdue Owl has a lot more on how um, MLA works cited pages and citing works. Um, it, they represent it much better than I ever could, and so I'll just defer to them as well. If you want to look up more about that today, you can click there. Otherwise, we will uh, devote some more time to citation later on uh, over these next couple of weeks as we are researching. I know that's a lot of information to take in. Let me just double back to our uh, agenda for today. I know it's a lot to take in today. Um, the main thing I'll ask you to do is be ready for class tomorrow. Again, we'll play a little research game to, to kind of put into practice some of the things we discussed here. We'll also uh, spend some time wrapping up our Colin's notes in practice, especially for those of you who are not in class on Tuesday. Peace.